studies are a type of observational study. We would like you to learn this study design particularly well. The cohort study provides the foundation for understanding other types of observational study designs. With the cohort study design, researchers follow an at-risk study population over time and evaluate exposures over time and determine the subsequent risk or rate of disease or health outcome. In this segment, we will cover the following learning objectives. First, to explain the definition of a cohort. Next, to recognize which measures of disease or health outcome occurrence are used in a cohort study design. Uh, you will also learn how to distinguish between open and closed cohorts, as well as prospective and retrospective cohorts. And lastly, you'll be able to list the advantages and disadvantages of cohort studies. Historically, the word cohort was used to describe a subunit of a Roman legion of soldiers. I mention this historic reference as it might, may help you remember the image of a group of people marching through time. A cohort is typically defined as a group of persons sharing a common characteristic. Epidemiologists may define their cohort by any number of shared factors. Some examples of a common characteristic are geographic location, occupation, socioeconomic status, age, gender, or race or ethnicity. A famous example of a cohort study was initiated in the early 1950s by Richard Dahl and Sir Austin Bradford Hill. Hill and Bradford began a 20-year study following a cohort of British physicians. The common characteristic defining this cohort was that they were male doctors whose names were in the 1951 British Medical Register. Thus, the characteristics used to assemble a cohort were occupation, physicians, and geographic location, Britain. At the outset of the investigation, the relevant demographic exposure or other factors were determined for each subject. The main baseline exposure of interest in the study was smoking, specifically tobacco cigarette smoking. Smoking was determined by questionnaires at baseline. The study subjects were asked if they were current smokers, past smokers, or had never smoked before. The outcome of interest was mortality or death. The mortality data was obtained from the Registrar's General of the United Kingdom and complemented with records from the British Medical Association. In the United States, you may have heard of cohorts such as the Women's Health Initiative. This cohort was comprised of 93,676 postmenopausal women between the ages of 50 and 79 and followed for approximately eight years. Other cohorts include the National Children's Study, a cohort of pregnant women in the United States, or the Framingham Heart Study. What do all these cohorts have in common? They were assembled with the common characteristics, such as age and gender, in mind. These cohorts then had key exposure characteristics assessed at baseline, and then the people participating were followed over time. The basic design of a cohort study ideally begins with a well-designated source population, either studied as a whole or a randomly selected sample. For example, all physicians included in the 1951 British Medical Register or a random sample of male physicians whose names were included in the 1951 British Medical Register. This population or random sample is then assessed and subjects are removed who already have the outcome or disease of interest, such as lung cancer or cardiovascular disease, or who don't meet whatever pre-designated inclusion criteria that investigators have decided upon. The goal here is that the eligible study population both accurately and efficiently represent the source population. For example, in a cohort study of prostate cancer, you would not likely want to include women. One criteria of our source population for this example would therefore be gender. So let's go over the cohort study basics. Cohort studies track participants over time. The subjects in a cohort study are selected to be free of the outcome of interest at the study onset, so it is clear that the exposure precedes the outcome. The exposure of interest is measured in all subjects at baseline and or at regular time points dur during the course of the study. Once the cohort is assembled and baseline exposures are measured, then study subjects are followed over time. The occurrence of the specific disease 
or health outcome of interest is followed closely. New outcome events such as incident cases of disease, death, or health status change are counted for all measures of the cohort throughout the follow-up period. New cases of the outcome are used to calculate whatever measures of incidence are relevant to the study, usually a risk or a rate. In the cohort of British physicians we mentioned earlier, the main exposure of interest in the study was smoking. It was determined by questionnaire at baseline. The study subjects were asked if they were current smokers, past smokers, or had never smoked before. The outcome of interest was mortality or death. An investigator may select a cohort specifically to study certain uncommon or rare exposures. In some cohort studies, population groups with known exposures to a suspected hazardous substance or environment are first identified and recruited for study, and then another population or group without that exposure is identified, and the risk or rate of that outcome over time is compared in the two groups. For this reason, cohort studies can be particularly useful for studying uncommon or rare exposures because usually it is possible to identify and assemble groups of persons who have that uncommon exposure. Other studies may create categories such as amalgam of risk factors for the disease or outcome under study. The famous Framingham Cardiovascular Cohort Study provided much of the evidence for what is known today regarding the risks of heart disease. The study subjects were initially categorized according to suspected risk factors, creating risk groups for comparison. These risk groups were then followed for 20 to 30 years. The development of cardiovascular disease among the various risk groups was then compared with statistical analysis. A cohort study of U.S. Air Force veterans from the Vietnam War was set up to examine the effects of exposure to Agent Orange, a defoliant dropped by planes during the campaign. This group of veterans were compared to Air Force pilots active at the same time with no involvement in the Agent Orange campaign. Attempting to conduct this study in the general population would have not been possible as exposure to Agent Orange is too rare. A common measure of health outcome occurrence in a cohort study is a risk or a rate. Since cohort studies are chosen to be free of the outcome of interest at the outset, only new health outcome events such as diseases, behavior changes, injuries, or even improvement in health status are considered. Note that some cohort studies of diseased persons have been conducted, for example, persons with arthritis. The outcome in these studies is not the development of the disease, but rather the consequences of having the disease, such as development of heart disease in persons with different types of arthritis, or mortality differences between people with different types of arthritis, or quality of life. In these cases, one could consider the disease type, the, the exposure. For risk, the total number of disease-free persons in the cohort is the denominator. For a rate, we only count person time at risk in the denominator. This is estimated by calculating the amount of time each person contributes to the study free of disease. When a subject develops the outcome of interest or disease, he or she is no longer contributing to person time. Similarly, those subjects lost to follow-up do not contribute person time as the investigator is unable to determine their health outcome status. We will now discuss the type of study population followed in a cohort study. Cohort study populations can be open or closed. In an open cohort, individuals are allowed to join the study at any point in time from the beginning to the end within limitations. In a closed cohort, the entire cohort is formed at the beginning of the study and the cohort is closed to new participants. An open study population collects person time. An open study population is also less prone to problems with sample size because study subjects can contribute person time even if they are in the study only for a short time. There are two types of cohort studies, retrospective and prospective and they are classified according to their temporal sequence. Retrospective and prospective refer to the time the investigator in initiates the study and starts collecting data. Both designs assemble cohorts on the basis of exposure first. In the retrospective study, the cohort is formed in the past. The prospective study starts now and goes into the future. In a prospective study, 
The investigators obtain baseline exposure data in real time and then follow the cohort members during the time after baseline exposure to measure the occurrence of the health outcome or disease. The retrospective or historical cohort study is often used to evaluate occupational exposures such as cancer and other chronic diseases in workers exposed to potentially hazardous substances. An example might be deaths from lung cancer among asbestos-exposed workers. Retrospective cohort studies are possible when historical records exist to identify the important baseline characteristics of study subjects from prior years, i.e. the list of workers employed at an asbestos mine between 1930 and 1940. The mortality experience of these workers can be traced through vital statistics and medical records from the baseline years to the present, and then compared with a similar non-asbestos mining cohort or with the general population. Using the British doctor study example again, we have a prospective cohort study. Prospective or concurrent cohort studies assess the baseline exposure in real time, and then cohorts are followed into the future. In this study, baseline measurements were made in real time of physician smoking habits as of 1951, when they received their initial questionnaire. Physicians were followed over time by a mailed questionnaire sent out every five or ten years, and their mortality was tracked by extensive records kept on physicians in the United Kingdom. Does smoking exposure precede mortality? Because exposure status was determined at baseline among living members of the British Medical Register in the study, we are certain that exposure preceded the outcome. Now let's talk about the advantages of cohort studies. We will discuss measures of association such as risk ratios and risk differences in next week's module. So let's summarize by considering the advantages and disadvantages of cohort studies. A big advantage of cohort studies is that they allow direct estimations of risks or rates. Investigators may specifically seek out individuals for study with an exposure that is not typical among the general population, as you remember our Agent Orange example. The ability to assess the effects of rare exposures is an advantage of the cohort study. Cohort studies can also be useful for assessing multiple outcomes. The various causes of mortality assessed in the British Physician Study illustrates the ability to assess multiple outcomes of a single exposure. This study examined all reported causes of mortality as per the current international list of causes of death. The researchers summarized their conclusions by identifying excess mortality among smokers by cause. A big disadvantage of cohort studies is that they are expensive. They are also time-consuming. Our ability to detect relatively small differences in risks and rates between exposed and unexposed groups is primarily influenced by the number of out health outcomes in each group rather than the number of persons in each exposed group. Thus, if there are relatively few persons in an exposure category, we may need a very long period of follow-up to observe sufficient numbers of rarer outcomes in order to detect differences across levels of exposure. This accounts for the considerable cost and time needed to properly conduct a cohort study. If outcomes are very rare, then the size of the cohort groups may be too large to effectively detect a difference between study groups. Examples of rare outcomes include certain cancers, such as acute leukemia or kidney cancer. Losses to follow-up occur when we cannot determine the outcome for some measures of the cohort during the entire course of follow-up. If losses are greater in the exposed versus the unexposed group or vice versa, we may obtain a biased estimate of the risk ratio or rate ratio. This concludes our segment on cohort study designs. Of all the study designs, we recommend that you learn this one particularly well because it's the basis for learning about all the other study designs.